If you haven't done so yet, please pause the video and try to answer the question on your own first before listening on. What we'll do is go ahead and draw a picture that represents the information that is described in the question. So here we have drawn a square and then at opposite corners we have two charges that are marked with an uppercase Q and then at the other opposite corners we have the charges marked with a lowercase Q. In addition we can call the length of each side of the square lowercase a. The question wants to know the value of lowercase Q so that the resultant force on capital Q is zero. Now there are two capital Q's we can arbitrarily select this one for our analysis. Whatever we conclude about this charge will be the same for this other charge since it is the same magnitude and it is also located at the corner of the square. We were told that uppercase Q was positive so we can mark these charges with positive signs. We don't know whether these corner charges in blue are positive or negative. For a moment let's assume that they were both positive. And we're going to show that this cannot be true, and here's why. Consider the force that would be acting on this charge right here as a result of this blue charge right here. Because they're both positive, they would push away from each other, and therefore this would be pushed downward. Now consider the force acting on this charge from this blue charge, which is also positive. So once again, they would be pushing away from each other, and that would cause a force to act in this direction. Finally, because the two red charges are both positive, they too would be repelling, and so you would have a force pushing this charge towards the lower right. Now, these three forces will not cancel each other out, so the net force of those three individual forces will not equal zero, and therefore that violates the assumption of the question. So, we can conclude that the blue charges are not positive, but in fact are negative. And so now let's proceed in drawing the force vectors. Now, we'll start by drawing the force acting between this charge and this charge. They are opposite and therefore will attract. And that means that we're going to have an upward force pulling Q in this fashion right here. And if we'd like, we can call that force F1. And if we do that, we might as well call this charge Q1 just to keep track of it. Now consider the force between this positive charge and this negative. Those are opposite charges. They will therefore attract each other. And so there's going to be a force pulling uppercase Q to the left. And we can label that force F2. And then we can call this charge Q2. Finally, we have the repulsive force between this charge, which is positive, and this other charge, which is positive. They'll push away from each other, and that's going to cause a force acting in this direction here. And we can go ahead and call that force F3. Now, there are three forces, and it's useful to organize them into a table. So we'll have F1, F2, and F3. And in this table, we want to figure out the X and the Y components. Consider F1. F1 is pointing straight up. And so it will have a Y component that for now we can call F1. It will have a X component of zero because it's not pointing in the X direction. F2 is pointing to the left, which is the X direction. Furthermore, it's the negative X direction. So we can write negative F2 right here, and there is no Y component. For F3, we're going to see that there is both an X and a Y component, and maybe we can draw those components. So we would have a component pointing to the right here, and then another component pointing downward. Now it turns out that this angle right here is going to be 45 degrees and we know that because if we draw the diagonal of a square the diagonal cuts the square into two equal angles and since this angle is 90 that's going to make this 45 and this 45. And so we can confidently conclude that this angle right here is 45 degrees which makes the x component F times, excuse me, F3 times the cosine of 45, and then the Y component is going to be F3 times the sine of 45. Notice the Y component is pointing downward, so we have to put a negative sign in there. So let's fill those components into the table. Now, let's not forget that the forces here are the electrostatic forces. And those forces are equal to K multiplied by the charges 
divided by the distance between the charges squared. And in fact, we have to use the magnitude of the charges, which is why we've included the absolute value sign. So for example, go back to force F1. That was acting between charge lowercase q and charge uppercase q. And so when we go over here into our table for F1, we can actually apply the Coulomb's law force. So we would have k multiplied by lowercase q, multiplied by uppercase q, divided by the distance between them squared. Remember we called the distance between them a, so we'll have a squared. The expression for F2 is going to be the same because it has the positive charge of uppercase Q and then the other charge of lowercase Q and the distance between them is A. So we'll fill that in for F2. And finally F3, that's acting between the two charges that were labeled with uppercase Q. So we know that F3 is going to be K times uppercase Q times uppercase Q divided by the distance between them squared. Now this distance right here, this diagonal of the square, turns out to be a radical 2. And that's true of any square. Whenever you have a square, whatever the distance of each side of the square is, the diagonal will always be d radical 2. And that can be proved using the Pythagorean theorem. For now, we'll take it for granted, and we'll note that the distance for the f3 force is a radical 2, and then we'll square it. So we're going to fill this expression in for the f3s. So here's our chart. We recall that the resultant force is supposed to be zero. What that means is if we add the x components together of the forces, that should equal zero. And the same is true for the y components. If we add those components together, that should also equal zero. Why don't we choose the x components first and see where we get? So we'll come over here. We'll take the first x component, which is zero. We'll add it to the next component, the next x component, which was negative k times q times uppercase q divided by a squared. And then we'll add that to the third x component. And then we'll set that equal to 0. Now we're trying to solve for lowercase q. Why don't we add this term right here over to the right hand side? And we can do that because it's a negative term. So we'll add it over to the right. We can see that we have a factor of uppercase q on both sides of the equation, so we can eliminate. Let's square this denominator. That's going to become a squared. And then the square root of 2 squared is just 2. So that'll become 2a squared on the bottom here. We would then have a factor of a squared on both sides. So that can cancel. We also have a factor of k on both sides. So let's eliminate that term. Now, the value of uppercase q was given to us as the square root of 2 times 10 to the minus 6 coulombs. This is all divided by 2. The cosine of 45 is radical 2 over 2. Now this radical 2 times this radical 2 will become radical 4, which is 2. And then this factor of 2 and that factor of 2 can cancel. And so it simplifies to 10 to the minus 6 divided by 2. And then if you perform that calculation, you will get 5 times 10 to the minus 7 coulombs is equal to the absolute value of q. Remember, we had concluded that q was a negative charge. So in fact, the final answer is negative 5 times 10 to the minus 7 coulombs. That will represent the charge, lowercase q.